We imagine a future. And our imaginings horrify us. Whoa, what a movie. Last week, I got the opportunity to see Oppenheimer, and I wanted to take a little bit of time today to explore some of the physics underlying the film that potentially was missed, or you might have been confused by, or potentially they just glanced over entirely because, hey, this is Hollywood and not a physics lecture, perfectly forgivable. All that to say, there will be spoilers in this, so if you have not seen the film, go and see it. You have been warned. I wanna dive in to the physics behind Oppenheimer. I want to start by talking about the bomb. This bomb that you see them building pretty much throughout the whole film, which they called the gadget, is an implosion bomb. This, interestingly, isn't actually the sort of bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Let's talk through the options that the Los Alamos team at the time had in terms of things that they could turn to. Oppenheimer and scientists had two types of nuclear fuel sources available to them, either uranium-235 or plutonium-239. Both of these materials can split apart through nuclear fission into two roughly equal parts, releasing fast neutrons that can split nearby atoms apart, unleashing the destructive force that is the nuclear bomb. Important to understand here that at this point in time, both of these materials were particularly hard to refine, which is a problem because you need enough of these materials, a critical mass, to where the nuclear reaction starts and can self-sustain itself. The early hope was to use plutonium-239 because it is easier to obtain in a quantity sufficient to create a critical mass. You can see this in the film as the two goldfish bowls side by side, one representing the 50 kilogram mass of uranium needed, the other representing the 10 kilograms of plutonium needed to make a bomb. Oppenheimer periodically fills these up with glass marbles to reflect the material that is slowly being refined. And I would like to pause here to reflect on the fact that 100% of physicists are this cinematically cool in their day-to-day -day lives. When you do finally have a critical mass of one of these materials, it is a pretty bad idea to keep it all in one place because, well, it can spontaneously blow up. So the idea was to create a gun-like bomb device that initially kept two masses of subcritical plutonium apart, and then, on detonation, accelerated one non-critical amount of plutonium into another non-critical amount of plutonium to initiate criticality. The problem that Oppenheimer and his team found was that as they started collecting meaningful quantities of plutonium-239, they noticed natural neutron capture events kept converting some of it into plutonium-240, which can undergo spontaneous fission and is prone to spontaneously self-detonating, meaning that a bomb couldn't achieve the densities fast enough needed to create an effective nuclear detonation. Now this would probably just make the device a dud, but potentially it could also make for a turbulent flight to drop this thing off. So on July 17th, the decision was made to cease work on the plutonium gun and instead turn to uranium. So the thin man bomb became the little boy bomb, all kind of weird naming conventions. The uranium gun type bomb was actually the bomb that was ultimately then dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima in August 6th of 1945. It was the first nuclear weapon used in a war, but Oppenheimer didn't want to turn his back on a plutonium based device, as in theory it should be much quicker to refine those materials, allowing for the device to be ready much earlier. Instead of a gun type bomb design, Oppenheimer's attention was turned to a different bomb architecture the implosion bomb. How do you avoid the dangers of working with a critical mass of nuclear fuel? You work with a non-critical mass of nuclear fuel. The Los Alamos team's plan was to take a far from critical mass amount of plutonium-239 and make it a critical mass amount of plutonium-239 only at the point of detonation. They did this by compacting the fuel through a perfectly timed series of explosions that would increase the density of the plutonium to the point where it could self-sustain fission. 
Throughout the movie, you saw these honeycomb-like objects being assembled around the spherical ball of plutonium. These are the explosion, or I guess potentially implosion, lenses. The manufacturing and timing of these explosions was a monumental task at this point in time, with technology available limited to very basic computers. You see in the film, time after time, this resulted in implosion tests that wouldn't compress the central mass evenly, so it would essentially leak out of the sides, never reaching criticality. To solve this, Oppenheimer turned to former classmate John von Neumann, a math wizard, who borrowed a concept from optical lenses and how they control the speed of propagation of a wave by using different materials. Von Neumann proposed a ring of high-speed explosives with internal lensing cavities of slower speed explosives to focus the compressive force evenly around the plutonium mass, collapsing it into a point. What's interesting to ask is how did the Los Alamos team measure how well their implosion devices were actually working when they were over in microseconds and they blow up the device? They had to develop a suite of diagnostic measurement techniques. This compressive mass idea is interesting and is actually still being developed as an approach to how teams around the world are trying to achieve fusion called inertial confinement fusion. I've got a video coming up soon that goes into deeper detail about this, so subscribe so you don't miss it. Oppenheimer's team used a panel of X-ray, magnetic, photographic, and radiation sampling techniques to watch the explosion and measure for uniformity. This device became the football or soccer ball device that you see throughout the movie. This was the device actually tested in the Trinity test and the same bomb type as the Fat Man later dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945, the second nuclear weapon used in the war. During the Trinity test, there's a scene where Richard Feynman, who up until that point is only really identifiable as bongo playing physicist number one, is sitting in a car to watch the test in classic Feynman fashion, he refuses to follow the advice of the lab using the welding glasses that are being handed out to observers, and instead says the glass windshield will protect him. Interesting thing is, he's right. This is the absorption spectra for glass. It largely blocks out the UV light spectrum, which was supposedly the main point of concern for eye damage, while letting through visible light to allow observation of the explosion. As an interesting side note, this is why it's virtually impossible to get a suntan while driving in your car with the windows up because the UV doesn't actually penetrate through. However, Feynman, I guess, forgot probably that visible light would also be reasonably bright. After the detonation, it's reported that he saw everything in purple for hours with an after image of the fireball briefly burned into his vision. Which brings me to a truism that I like to live my life by, never trust a theorist. In the final acts of the film, the conversation focuses on the super, the next class up of atomic weapon, combining the splitting apart of heavy atoms, fission, with the combining of light atoms, fusion, specifically isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium. This is essentially three bombs in one, a chemical implosion bomb that detonates a fission bomb that generates heat and x-rays sufficient to compress and ignite a fusion bomb. To put the destructive power of these weapons into perspective, the Hiroshima gun type uranium bomb was 15 kilotons of TNT. The Nagasaki implosion bomb was 21 kilotons of TNT. The SAR bomb, a hydrogen bomb or super bomb, was 50 megatons of TNT, more than 2,000 times as powerful as Nagasaki. This whole film is so incredibly well delivered, I think so well brought to life because of the amount of actual footage that survives from the days of Los Alamos. So many scenes were created essentially near picture perfect to the archival footage that I've seen. It really was unbelievable. The only other points that I wanted to pull out were two. One, there is a scene where Oppenheimer is talking to someone, I forget who it is, but they ultimately end up leaving by a car. As the car leaves, it reveals standing sheepishly behind the car, Einstein. And that is the sort of reveal that I think should only be reserved for buddy cop movies or romantic comedies, which is, regardless of which one, totally something I could get behind. Hollywood, please make it happen. Two, this film, Oppenheimer, has one of the first visual motifs I've seen in a film that I think reasonably accurately captures actually what it's like to think about and visualize physics. My only comment would be maybe the visuals sometimes make it seem that Oppenheimer's imagination places himself in this magical 
galaxy of physics with him at the center. And I think in my experience, the visuals or how you go about thinking about really complicated systems, you kind of imagine these things happening in front of you. There's a huge amount of like visual imagination that's happening. Uh, but usually it's watching those simulations kind of evolve, maybe then rewinding in time and watching them evolve again in time that always kind of talk about the beauty of physics to me. I think the visual language used in this film was as close as I've ever seen anyone get in accurately describing what it actually feels like to think about those things, which I thought was really cool to watch. Oppenheimer, a story of an American Prometheus. A parable I think a lot of us kind of dismiss. Come on, you know, stealing fire from the gods, we're entitled to fire, what's the worst that can happen? Surely that is a needlessly guarded secret. I guess they forgot some specifications, those gods. It's what we burn that matters. The fuel sources we found more recently that maybe the gods of the past were actually warning us away from this whole time. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.